Hello, my name is Lowell Vanderpool, and this channel is dedicated to IT students, IT professionals, and anyone who enjoys learning technical subjects. We are going to be looking at Wi-Fi 7, the new standard that was released in 2024. We are not going to sell any products in this presentation, but what we are going to do is look at the new technology and features that come with Wi-Fi 7. We're also going to be as practical as we possibly can. If you don't understand wireless, you're going to waste your money buying products and trying to make it work. I'm not saying it won't work but you're not going to come anywhere close to making Wi-Fi work properly in your home or small business if you don't understand how wireless works. So we're going to be very practical, not sell any products, and talk about Wi-Fi 7 and what are some of the features that really might be game changer. Wi-Fi 7 builds on the news April 23rd, 2020. The FCC released a huge chunk of 6 gigahertz spectrum to unlicensed Wi-Fi users. That allowed manufacturers, companies to start using the 6 gigahertz spectrum for wireless. That was a huge change. Remember, this was right in the middle of COVID. So it was an absolute necessity since so many people were working and going to school and doing everything from home. The IEEE started working on Wi-Fi 7 back in July of 2018, and it wasn't released until 2024. We had Wi-Fi 6E released very quickly so that we could take advantage of that 6 gig spectrum. But none of the standards have had time enough to allow the engineers to look at this new spectrum and really make the best use of it. Now, the next standard that's coming is Wi-Fi 8. It's 802.11bn, Wi-Fi 7 is 802.11be. People often don't understand wireless. The fundamental protocol that's the basis for all wireless is called Carrier Sense Multiple Access Collision Avoidance. It's a big acronym. But what it's saying is that wireless operates at half duplex, just like a walkie-talkie. Only one person can talk at a time. We hoped that Wi-Fi 7 would introduce full duplex, which will be a huge benefit in wireless, but it was not included in the Wi-Fi 7 standard. We're now looking at Wi-Fi 8. Hopefully, full duplex will be involved in Wi-Fi 8. I want you to look at this chart. We see Wi-Fi standards from 2007, Wi-Fi 4, 2013, Wi-Fi 5, Wi-Fi 6, Wi-Fi 6E, and now Wi-Fi 7. And if you look at the bandwidth that has been proposed for each of these standards, you can see 7 gigs at Wi-Fi 5, 9.6 gigabits in 2019 with the introduction of Wi-Fi 6, and of course this whopping 36 gigabits per second in Wi-Fi 7. The problem is you buy these access points and you buy the products in your home and they don't come anywhere close to these values. That's what you have to understand if you want to understand wireless. Just for an example, if you've got a new phone and it touts the fact that it has Wi-Fi 7 support and you're thinking you're going to get 36 gigabit download on your mobile phone, you're not understanding wireless. You might get 36 gigabit download on this phone, but the battery will be dead in two minutes. So it's so important to understand wireless 
and the platforms that we use it on so that your expectations are correct. So Wi-Fi 7 is also known as Extreme High Throughput, E-H-T. In networking, they love acronyms. It's going to have 320 megahertz channels, and I'll tell you why that doesn't mean a whole lot. It's going to have multi-link operations, and I'm going to spend some time trying to explain this technology, and hopefully it will pan out like everyone hopes it will. We don't have time yet enough with this standard and products to know whether this is really going to work like it says it is. 4K QAM. This is a great way of getting more bits per second. The trouble is you have to have a very good signal for 4K QAM and you might get it in the room where your access point is at. If you have to go through a sheetrock wall, the room next door to your access point, you're not going to get 4K QAM. This is what I mean about the practical understanding of Wi-Fi. If you don't understand it, the features are great on paper, but once you get this equipment out in the real world, you find out that some things just don't work like they expected. If you're thinking Wi-Fi is simple, stop. Wi-Fi is so complex. Now, honestly, LTE and 5G are probably more complex, but Wi-Fi, especially Wi-Fi 7, has added a layer of complexity that's pretty mind-blowing. Take a look at this graphic. Focus in on the center. On the center at the bottom, we see the PHY. This represents the physical layer, OSI layer one. Above it is the MAC. It's a small block. It's going to have OSI layer two. This is your data link layer. And what they have done is they have broken out the architecture that is found in the new Wi-Fi 7 layer two. Look at it. It's pretty astonishing. You have a blue section called multi-link operation. It's at layer two and it breaks out into this complex architecture that's going to handle MLO, which we're going to get into. And then MIMO, if you go to the bottom in red, there's a whole block diagram of architectural changes in MIMO. Then we have multi-AP coordination over in purple. And then we have some granularity and process method, which I believe some of these have not changed across standards. This is not radical changes. The changes are in those upper layers in the Mac or layer two. Then if you look at physical layer, we have support for 4K QAM. We have things like, yeah, I didn't write these, preamble puncturing, we'll get into that. Multi UR support, which is going to allow access points to better and more efficiently handle multiple users. This is a typical design of a Wi-Fi 7 access point. Look at the SOC chip, BCM67263 SOC. This is a massively complex chip that handles only six gig. Then you're gonna have another very complex radio chip, BCM6726, and it's gonna handle just five gigs. And we see there's a chip dedicated to 2.4. You're gonna have chips dedicated to 10 gigabit WAN connections. And then you've got this BCM4916, which is a quad core ARM processor designed specifically to tie all this together, USB, LEDs, RAM that you're going to put in your access point. These things are going to be incredibly complex. Now, the first generation of chips that make up your access point, just be aware they're beta. There's going to be 
problems they're going to find in their initial designs and a year later these chips are going to change. Be aware, don't go out and buy necessarily the first generation of Wi-Fi 7. I'm not going to say it doesn't work, but a lot of debugging and problems are going to be solved and they'll be fixed in the second generation of silicon that's used to build the next generation of Wi-Fi 7. One of the new features of Wi-Fi 7 is the option of 16 by 16 multi-user MIMO. Can you imagine an access point with 16 antennas so that it can support 16 by 16 multi-user MIMO? I don't think we're going to see 16 by 16 multi-user MIMO. The key to all these technologies, Wi-Fi 6, Wi-Fi 6E, Wi-Fi 7, are the support of the silicon manufacturers, Qualcomm, Broadcom, MediaTek, their RF engineers, which are amazingly bright people, are the ones who are designing the silicon that we put in our consumer products and our enterprise products. Here's one for laptops and probably mobile phones. Here on the FastConnect 7900 SOC chip, it has a 6 gigahertz radio that is going to hopefully give you 5.8 gigabits per second. And it also has a 5 gigahertz radio that's going to give you 4.3 gigabits per second. This is realistic for the first generation. This is a quad core ARM SOC from Broadcom for residential Wi-Fi access points, routers, and extenders. Keep in mind, silicon is produced for retail and there's silicon produced for enterprise. MediaTek is another silicon manufacturer of both retail and enterprise chipsets for wireless. Yes, Wi-Fi 7 is going to bring lots of cool features, better speed, all of that. But keep in mind, it's all about that 6 gigahertz spectrum. If we didn't have that addition of 6 gigahertz spectrum, we wouldn't have a Wi-Fi 7. This is going to bring such new innovation for environments that are crowded and dense, like airports, sports arenas, large retail complexes that are trying to put Wi-Fi everywhere. This is where the six gigahertz spectrum really shines. We will gain things like lower latency. We will get the ability to offer what's called time sensitive networking. But it's that six gigahertz that's making all the difference. Let me show you an example. One of the problems that warehouses have, especially very, very large warehouses, I live in central Florida. It's one of the capitals of warehouses. We have warehouses 30 miles up and down I-4. They're huge warehouses. And they have robots working with people in these mammoth warehouses. These robots are all Wi-Fi controlled. And with just five gigs and 2.4, it's a nightmare to control all these robots that they're using in the warehouses. But the minute you put a bridge radio on there so that they now can talk to six gigahertz, you've got this huge spectrum that just eliminates so many problems for the IT professionals that are communicating and working with these robots. Hospitals are another area that are starved for bandwidth. 5 gigahertz, 2.4 are just packed and crammed. And when medical applications come out that really need more bandwidth, more high-speed thoroughput, it's just not there. My mother went into surgery, and she was in the emergency room, and she had been, been taken care of by the nurses and enrolled something like this. It was battery-powered. It had a monitor and a camera and she was able to communicate with the doctor with this portable battery powered communication station. The so doctor could have been in a larger hospital nearby or whatever but this type of high definition high bandwidth demanding medical application 
can easily work with six gigs. Now, six gigs is not without its own problems. This is the spectrum for six gigs, but notice the section below it. These are called incumbent systems. These are systems already have been approved by FCC to use six gigs. Things like police have got a section of this six gigahertz or fixed services such as point to point backhaul links. There's also satellite communications from Earth to a satellite and back that are also going to be impacted by the use of Wi-Fi in the six gigahertz spectrum. There's mobile services and ultra wideband services. As you think about using Wi-Fi 6 outdoors, there are going to be restrictions so that you don't conflict with incumbent systems that are already approved outdoors for six gigs. Bottom line, six gigahertz transmission outdoors, restrictions. Six gigahertz transmission indoors, no problem. Let's continue looking at the features of Wi-Fi 7. One of them is 4K QAM. This simply allows you to send more bits per second. It is when we send two carrier signals at 90 degrees, we are modulating those signals both amplitude and by phase. This gives us quadrature amplitude modulation. QAM is a very popular way of modulating carrier signals to transmit digital data. Digital cable television uses QAM. Cable modems, the DOCSIS system, uses QAM. LTE and 5G uses QAM. Digital radio, terrestrial television broadcasting all use QAM to modulate their signals and satellite communications. 4K QAM simply means we're putting lots of bits per symbol we transmit. What's the downside of 4K QAM? Well, you have to have a very good signal to noise ratio. In other words, your signal has to be strong. If you're within 18 feet of an access point, you probably get 4K QAM. If your phone or your laptop is further than 18 feet, you're probably not going to get 4K QAM. Now, if you modify your antenna so that you have a gain of about 4 dB on your antenna, which you can, you can get high gain antennas, you can get about 25 feet away from that access point and still get 4K QAM. Multi-link operation is another one of the big features that is new to Wi-Fi 7. I want you to listen carefully to the definition because in the verbiage of Wi-Fi, they're going to use the term link. And in this case, we're going to be talking about multi-link operation. But I want you to watch very carefully what they're talking about when they say the word link. So let's get started with the definition. Multi-link operation refers to sending or receiving packets currently at the same time on multiple channels in the same bands. That means 2.4 gigs, 5 gigs, or six gig band or different bands. Look at my chart here. I've got 2.4 gig band. Notice I have three channels. If I choose 20 megahertz wide channels, I can get three channels in 2.4. If I go to five gig and I choose 20 megahertz channels, I can get 25 channels in the five gigahertz band. Look again at Milo's definition. I can send or receive packets concurrently on multiple channels in the same band. So multi-link operation could mean I could get a couple channels here in the five gig, let's say these two channels, and come down at the end of the spectrum and get these two channels. That's multi-link operation even though I'm in the same band. I could also grab a channel in the 2.4. I could grab four channels in the five gig, and then I could grab 10 channels in the six gig. And all those concurrently send data in different bands. So either of those can represent multi-link operation. Let's step back. Wi-Fi 6E, we had 2.4. We had five gig, 
and we had six gig. With Wi-Fi 6E, you could transmit and receive over 2.4, 5, or 6, but one or the other. That completely changes with Wi-Fi 7. With multi-link operation and Wi-Fi 7, I now can connect to multiple channels on 5 gig. I could connect to multiple channels on 2.4, 5 gig, and 6 gig, or I could connect to multiple channels on 5 gig and 6 gig and transmit and receive data at the same time. Now, we've been aggregating connections, such as if I have two connections to my server, say two 10 gig connections to my server, I can use network teaming and combine the traffic of those two 10 gig links and aggregate that data. So we've been doing this kind of stuff in, in servers. We even can do it in desktops today. But it's really complex to do it with wireless. Now, one more important definition. Any device that supports multi-link operation is known as an MLD, multi-link device. You're going to see that in a lot of literature, so just be aware of what an MLD is. Now, before you get too fired up thinking of, oh, all these streaming connections to my laptop, I'm going to have incredible experiences. Let's get real. Look at this picture, this diagram on the right-hand side. I've got a phone, and it's sitting somewhere in my house. And I've got an access point somewhere in the house. And there you see the range of six gigahertz shown in the yellow. And then five gigahertz range is shown in the blue. And then the 2.4 gigahertz radio does pretty good about radiating out further than the other two bands. But my phone doesn't see that five gigs and it doesn't know six gigs exist. Do you think that phone will ever enjoy multi-link operation? Not a chance. So as we explore multi-link operation and all the fantastic things that it can do for us, look at the reality of wireless. And you'll realize unless you have access points close to the devices that need them, and they are MLD devices, you're never going to use multi-link operation for a long time. If you're thinking about a Wi-Fi 7 router, one, in a small apartment or a small condo where everything is relatively close together, you can probably get away with it to a great degree as long as those devices that need that high bandwidth, those Wi-Fi 7 features, you're relatively close by. And you don't have a solid brick wall between the access point and the high definition TV. And let's be honest, if you bought this beautiful TP-Link Wi-Fi 7 one router and put it in your house and you had even a large house, your wireless will work. It's probably working at Wi-Fi 5 standard level, but it'll work. It'll work fine. But you're going to miss out on all those multi-link operations, 4K QAM. You're not going to have 4K QAM. So be aware and understand the realities of wireless as you're purchasing and placing and buying the devices that work with this, understand the realities, otherwise you're gonna be really disappointed. Look at this heat map for a typical home. I've got one router in, looks like the living room. You can see the red and then it gets orange and then it gets green and it gets blue. That is indicating the strength of the signal. So if I have one router in a decent size home, as I get further, I have walls, and I get further and further away. If I put a high-definition TV in that back bedroom, yes, it will work. It'll be pixelated, look like SD television coming out of it, and it may not be horrible, but you're not going to get Wi-Fi 7 features or Wi-Fi 6 when you're that far away from the access point. You're probably going to get Wi-Fi 5. So why are all the vendors going mesh? Because they realize this very, very well. And if you're not able to put access points 
throughout the home or closer to the devices that need it, you're not going to get the benefit of the speed, MIMO, multi-link operation, beamforming, all those great features that give you higher and higher throughput. You're just, they're not going to be there. So here's an example of one of Wi-Fi 7's features, multi-link operation. If you had a mesh network in your home, one access point on the first floor, one access point on the second floor, they are saying, this is TP-Link's Deco, they're saying that if you're relatively close to any of those access points on the first floor or the second floor, you're going to get about eight or nine gigabits wireless speed. As you get further away from those access points, either on the first floor or the second floor, you're going to drop down to seven or eight gigabits. And that depends on how many sheetrock walls are between you and, and that access point. And on the edge of the home, five to six gigabits. But that's only if you use some kind of mesh design in your home. Let's talk quickly about phones. If you have a inexpensive phone, you're probably going to have a single Wi-Fi radio in that phone. Maybe multiple antennas, but a single radio. If it's a Wi-Fi 7 chipset in the phone and a Wi-Fi 7 access point, you're going to see an improvement in thoroughput. Not great, but it will be better. In higher-end phones, they're going to have what's called enhanced multi-link single radio, where they are going to look at the bands find the best band with the least amount of interference where they get the best thoroughput and they'll simply switch to that band. If that band gets congested or interference, they'll quickly switch to another. So again, you're going to get better thoroughput overall if the technology is in the phone and in the access point. So if you buy premium phones, for example, Galaxy S23 Ultra had the Qualcomm X70 modem, which had a dual radio. If it was up to Wi-Fi 7 standards, you could now transmit multi-band. The problem is, is how much are you going to want that to impact your battery? How vendors will address that, we'll just have to wait and see. So a quick look at this chart. If you have single radios, you're gonna get some benefits with MLO. If you got multiple radios, you're going to get a lot more benefit out of MLO. If you have multiple radios and you're using multiple bands, one of the mind-blowing features of MLO is the switching speed. They're able to switch from one band to another at really incredible low latency. For example, a typical teardown and breakdown of a link, you're talking about 100 milliseconds. So they have designed the architecture so that you could switch from six to five to two, I don't know why you'd go to two, but six to five back and forth very fast and keep that latency below two milliseconds. Now this slide, I'm being facetious here, you don't need a generator to run your laptop with Wi-Fi 7, but one of the problems with multi-link operation is if your radios are listening to all three bands, you're drawing lots of power. So just keep in mind that's going to be a consideration by the designers of the equipment and the chipset manufacturers, but just be aware that's an unresolved issue in multi-link operation. Now, couple more issues with multi-link operation. We have what's known as asynchronous, simply means that every band can send whenever and whatever they want. But they also have what's known as synchronous transmission, that the bands are transmitting data in sync. Who's going to use that and why that's there? We don't understand that right now, but that is there. Another mind-blowing feature of MLO is what's called duplicate mode. So I could take my 2.4 gigabits radio, my 5 gig radio, my 6 gig radio, and transmit exactly the same thing across all three bands. I get incredible potential of reliability. <laughs> forget high-speed data, forget everything else. If I'm looking for incredibly high, reliable data transfer, this duplicate mode can provide it. Who's going to use it? 
I don't know, but it's in the standard. I just finished two videos, one on Wi-Fi standard 6E and wireless mesh technologies. I encourage you, if you're interested in wireless and want to understand it, make sure you get the wireless mesh technology and the Wi-Fi 6E standards because I'm going to cover many of those things that are also included in Wi-Fi 7, but I've already covered them in Wi-Fi 6E. So take a look at that. Last tip is for my IT pros. If you're thinking about taking down those Wi-Fi 5 access points off your ceiling and replacing them with Wi-Fi 7, here's a couple tips. You may want to have to resurvey your wireless radio pattern because there's a difference and you're going to add six gigs and Wi-Fi 5 may behave a little bit different. So if you're thinking, I'm just going to take these down and put these up, you might want to think about that. Second of all, if your switch port is connected to your access points, you want to make sure that you're using at least a 2.5 gigabit per second switch port to your access point at Wi-Fi 7 standards. I don't think you're going to need 10 gigs, and I'm speaking from watching the CTOs of Extreme Networks. He didn't feel like you needed to go to 10 gigs for your access points on Wi-Fi 7. One last thing, make sure if you're powering your access points with power over Ethernet, make sure you rebudget your power. Because if you don't have enough power to that Wi-Fi 7 access point you got hanging on the ceiling, it's just going to reboot all day. So if you're getting reboots, go back and redo your PoE power budget because you're not getting enough power to those access points. There are other things in the Wi-Fi 7 standard. Preamble puncturing, super wide channels, 320 megahertz wide channels, which no one is going to ever use. 512 compressed block acknowledge. Multiple are used to a single STA. This is simply going to allow that access point to be more efficient, handling more users. Triggered uplink access. And inclusion in this standard is the Emergency Preparedness Communication Service. How that actually works, I tried digging into this. I couldn't get a lot of information, but it seems that Wi-Fi 7 standard will allow emergency response teams to take better advantage of Wi-Fi 7 in an emergency. Just as we saw in Wi-Fi 6E, the new standard power access point, which is one of three access points, can be used both indoor and outdoor. Much more power, but remember, the minute you take six gigs outdoors, you are under many restrictions, how you can angle your antenna. You must have an AFC database to tell you, are you interfering with an incumbent existing six gigahertz system? So there's going to be a lot more restrictions when you take Wi-Fi 7 outdoors. A little bit more power, but you are under some restrictions. We love your comments, your feedback. Become a member. If you haven't thought about becoming a member, become a member. It helps us tremendously. Thanks again to all our members, viewers, and subscribers. You guys are awesome. Thank mm -hmm. you.